uh, we will go ahead and get started with our first pre presenter, uh, Dr. Seth DeVries from Helen DeVos Children's Hospital will join us now and uh, do his part of the presentation. So Dr. DeVries, if you can start your video and unmute yourself and then share your screen. Welcome. All right, thanks for having me, you guys. I am thrilled to be able to be a, a part of this. Um, I always enjoy working with the Epilepsy Foundation and um, uh, participating in all of the, uh, the work and effort that they do. Um, you guys do such amazing, amazing stuff. It's always, um, it's, it's just an honor to, to, to be uh, uh, involved and associated with you guys. So um, as uh, was previously stated, my name is Seth DeVries. I'm a pediatric neurologist and epileptologist at Helen DeVos Children's Hospital. Um, and I am here today uh, to discuss innovations in epilepsy surgery. Specifically, uh, I'm going to be talking about the, that pre-surgical uh, part of the workup for any child or, or adult uh, who uh, presents with medication-resistant epilepsy for which surg surgery uh, is, is an option uh, for, for them. So to start with, we will talk a little bit about what is epilepsy and what is medication-resistant epilepsy. Then I can, uh, I'm going to very briefly discuss what is the management of medication-resistant epilepsy. That includes both pharmacological management and non-pharmacological management. Um, then we will go over in, in a lot more detail that pre-surgical evaluation. After that, I will be handing over uh, a discussion to uh, my uh, friend and colleague, Dr. Patra, who will discuss more about this, those surgical options. So what is epilepsy? Uh, as many of you guys uh, uh, may, may know already, epilepsy uh, is defined as recurrent unprovoked seizures. And so what does recurrent mean? It means two or more unprovoked seizures. And unprovoked means that there's no identical cause for the seizure itself. So after a single unprovoked seizure, the risk of having a second unprovoked seizure is about 40 to 45%. And if a person has had two unprovoked seizures, their risk of having a third unprovoked seizure is about 65 to 75%. So you can see that after two seizures, there is much higher than a coin flip of continuing to have seizures. So it's at that point that we make that diagnosis of epilepsy. Now, back in uh, uh, 2014, the International League Against Epilepsy also uh, came out with some additional uh, um, guidelines and recommendations for more practical diagnosis, which says that if a person has a single unprovoked seizure and they have an EEG or an MRI that indicates a risk for seizures, then we can make that practical diagnosis of epilepsy. And that's an important thing for us to recognize as well. Now, epilepsy is a lot more common than we might think. I love this, uh, this uh, uh, statistic from the Epilepsy Foundation and, uh, you know, that's out there. Approximately one in 26 people in the United States develop, develop epilepsy at some point in their lifetime. Now, for my patients in, in pediatric neurology, I always talk about how that basically means that there's a child in every classroom that has this diagnosis or will have this diagnosis in the future. And there's a lot of people, a lot of people. So for example, Lil Wayne, Lil Wayne has epilepsy. Charles Dickens, Charles Dickens had epilepsy. Teddy Roosevelt had epilepsy. Prince had epilepsy. Uh, for those of you who are sports fans, uh, Tiki Barber and Rondé Barber, um, uh, two uh, NFL stars, uh, both of them had childhood epilepsy when they were kids. Hugo Weaving, um, star of uh, film, movie star of films like uh, 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 The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings and The Matrix. Um, he has epilepsy. He talks about it quite a bit. And then for, so, uh, for, for many of you, you might know who this is. This is Cameron Boyce and Cameron Boyce had epilepsy. One of the important uh, uh, stories about Cameron is uh, what happened to him in, uh, in uh, uh, J July 6 of 2019, uh, the news came out that Cameron had passed away. And Cameron had passed away from a condition called SUDEP. SUDEP stands for Sudden Unexpected Death and Epilepsy. 
Now, we don't know much about Cameron's story. All we know is that he had epilepsy. We don't know what kind of epilepsy. We don't know what kind of seizures. We don't know what medicine he was taking. We don't know if he was taking medicine. All we really know is that Cameron had epilepsy and that he died of his of, of, of SUDEP. And that's important because in the end, when we talk about SUDEP and we talk about the risk of SUDEP, although, the, although SUDEP is rare, it exists. And people with a history of medication-resistant epilepsy, people with a history of, um, of, of epilepsy and seizures that do not respond to medications are at a higher risk of sudden unexpected death and epilepsy. So this brings up the question, well, what is medication-resistant epilepsy? So drug-resistant epilepsy may be defined as a failure of adequate trials of two tolerated and appropriately chosen and used anti-epilepsy drug schedules. And so what that means is that if a person has been on two medicines, if two or more medicines have failed to treat a patient's seizures, well, then that patient is uh, uh, considered to have medication-resistant epilepsy. Now, there's a lot of numbers that are out there, uh, but essentially, Roughly half, one half, or uh, to two thirds of all patients will respond to the very first medication that they, that, that they take. Now, if that medicine fails, the likelihood of the second medicine working for them is somewhere to between 10 and 25%. And if that medicine fails, the likelihood of a third medicine working is about 5%. And if that medicine fails, the likelihood of a fourth medication working is about 1%. And if that medicine fails, there's a less than 1% chance of a fifth medication working for that individual. So when you break down those numbers, roughly two thirds to three, roughly 66 to 75% of our patients will respond to the first one or two medications that they take. But that means that there's about 33 to 25% of our patients with epilepsy who do not respond. They have medication-resistant epilepsy. And if that's the case, what do we do? Why does this matter? Well, it matters because, frankly, like I had mentioned earlier, SUDEP is just one of the things that we, can, that, that we have concerns about. But in addition to that, there's a lot of other issues that can, that can present with medication-resistant epilepsy. There are the psychosocial disabilities, like undereducation. If this causes an issue with our, with our education, underemployment is a, uh, can be an issue. Impaired socialization, how am I going to get out and, and go about in the world if I'm always uh, at, at risk of having a seizure? If I'm afraid that I'm gonna have a seizure, do I really wanna uh, take that, that day trip out to the mall? Or do I really wanna take that weekend up in Sleeping Bear Dunes? Maybe not. Maybe, maybe, that's the, maybe my seizures are keeping me from being able to do that stuff. And then psychiatric disturbances. We do know that patients with epilepsy, patients with uncontrolled epilepsy, excuse me, uh, uh, pardon me, patients with medication resistant epilepsy are at a higher risk of developing anxiety and depression. And that matters. In addition to that though, there's the medical disturbance. If somebody is at constant risk of having a seizure, there's a higher risk of injuries related to those seizures. And once again, SUDEP, there's an, there's an increased risk of death with medication-resistant epilepsy. So what do we do about all of this? What can we do? Well, there's the continued pursuit of pharmacological management. There are all sorts of medications that are coming forward that we are learning about, that we are investigating. And, and as more medicines are available, uh, the, the likelihood of somebody responding uh, goes up. But unfortunately, there is still that 25 to 33 percent of, of the population of, of the epilepsy population that does not respond to medicines, no matter what we do. So what about the non-pharmacological management? Well, one option is dietary management, like the ketogenic diet or modified Atkins diet. Now, this is a very, very specific diet. And quite frankly, it does require uh, uh, um, monitoring and uh, close follow-up with a registered dietitian. I highly recommend that if somebody is interested in the ketogenic diet, that they um, work with a dietitian and your epileptologist to make sure that it's being done properly. Because just like medicine, this diet can cause side effects. We have to be careful about that. What else is out there? Well, there's neurostimulation. 
Now, neurostimulation is, uh, can be uh, broken down into three different categories, or there's three different major types of neurostimulation. And I'm gonna uh, allow Dr. Patra to go into that with more detail. But essentially, neurostimulation, there, uh, a person can receive what's known as the vagus nerve stimulator, or they might receive a uh, responsive neurostimulator, or they might undergo deep brain stimulation. All of these different types of stimulation are effective or can be effective in adequate or, or successful uh, epilepsy management. And then the third option for non-pharmacological treatment is surgical intervention. And that could be resection of the, of the brain tissue that is causing the seizures, or that might be uh, ablation, laser ablation uh, of that area. All of these uh, are, are, are very important and very exciting areas uh, for intervention. But in order to identify or, or allow a patient to undergo these types of uh, interventions, we have to do a very thorough evaluation. So what does that pre-surgical evaluation look like? Well, this is just a, a, a quick list short list, frankly, of, all, of, of some of the things that we do to assess for pre-surgery, uh, pre-surgical evaluation. Now, many of you probably have undergone an EEG or you know somebody who has undergone an EEG. And so that EEG is there to measure all those squiggly lines. It's measuring that brainwave activity, the electrical activity in the brain to identify seizures. Not only to identify seizures, but ha to, have, um, to, to allow us an opportunity to identify where are those seizures coming from. And then there's all sorts of different ways uh, uh, to identify or to, to look at the structure with neuroimaging. There's the, uh, the, the uh, MRI uh, that can look at the, um, uh, the, the structure of the brain to look for any sort of structural abnormalities. And then there's the potential for a PET scan. Now, a PET scan is looking at how does the brain metabolize uh, certain forms of energy. There's the functional MRI. A functional MRI is used to identify uh, what parts of the brain are responsible for what parts of, of the body's um, uh, activity. There's something called a SPECT. A SPECT is used to identify uh, uh, where is there an increased uh, rate of blood flow during a seizure. And then there's something called a MEG, a magnetoencephalogram, which looks at the magnetic charge, the magnetic signal that is produced with these uh, epileptiform discharges with these uh, uh, discharges that, that are produced uh, by the brain's neurons. In addition to that, we also have to look at uh, some, uh, some other testing, like a neuropsychological evaluation. And then we can also, depending on where we're concerned about, we might need to uh, assess a patient's visual fields. If there's a concern for, is surgery or ablation going to cause any sort of visual field deficit for our patients? All of these things uh, are oftentimes utilized prior to ever going into the operating room for surgery. Now I'm gonna go into this with a little bit more detail. So an EEG, an EEG is a test that detects the electrical activity in the brain. We use small electrodes that measure that electrical signal and those differences in the electrical signals, they allow us to analyze and interpret and potentially potentially diagnose epilepsy. Now, an abnormal EEG does not guarantee a diagnosis of epilepsy. And, an, and a normal EEG does not rule out a diagnosis of epilepsy. Our EEG is a tool to assist in that diagnosis. Now, there are different ways that we look at an EEG. And this is an example of just one way that we look at an EEG. This is, uh, I, I'm not asking anybody to know how to read this. This is not what the lecture is about today, but this is just, you see all these squiggly lines and, and this is what a normal EEG looks like in a child. That's totally normal. And I just wanted to show you all those squiggly lines and, and just have some fun with that. And then we have to consider what types of EEGs we're gonna be using. There's the scalp EEG, which uh, many of you are, are likely familiar with. That's when we place the EEG electrodes on the, on the head uh, our um, EEG technologists will oftentimes glue or, or, or uh, uh, adhere those electrodes onto the skin. This is a non-invasive uh, procedure. Um, and then there's the intracranial EEG. That is when uh, we work with our neurosurgeons to actually place electrodes either directly on top of the brain 
or sometimes we use depth electrodes to go into the brain uh, to, to read all of this. And the, there are pros and cons for both of these types of, of, of EEGs. Now with a scalp EEG, it is important that we uh, uh, recognize that it, re it requires a very large signal uh, to, to pick up anything that's happening on that scalp. Roughly six square centimeters, the signal needs to be roughly six square centimeters for us to even capture anything on a scalp EEG. Because remember, it, that signal has to go through not only the brain, but the membrane, the dura of the brain has to go through all of the, uh, the, the tissue. It has to go through the skull. It has to go through uh, the skin. Um, all of that signal has to pass through. It has to be strong enough to pass through all of that just to get to that scalp EEG. Whereas if we're using an intracranial EEG, that's, that electrode is directly on top of the brain or in the brain. And so you have that direct connection uh, to the signal. The accuracy of a scalp EEG it allows for broad coverage, but there's very uh, little precision. So sometimes we might have a signal that, you know, maybe it's coming from our temporal lobe, but for some reason that signal is pointing up. And so it's picked up at the top instead of on the side. And that matters. Or what if that signal is, is coming from, uh, from our frontal lobe, but the signal is actually aimed towards the side and we pick it up over here. So yes, we can pick up that signal, but maybe it's not really showing up in the place that we expect it to. An intracranial EEG, on the other hand, allows us that direct connection to the source, but it might miss that source if we don't have the electrodes in the right spot. So that intracranial electrode, maybe if we have it directly on, on top of that frontal lobe, we're picking it up immediately. But if that electrode is over here, we're never going to pick up that, in, that information that's coming from over here. Now, a scalp EEG, also, we, we worry a little bit about artifact, and we have to keep that in mind, right? The... Uh, the um, the muscle artifact, the eyes, the tongue, the pulse, the EKG, all of this can create a little bit of artifact. And we just have to know that, recognize that that can happen and be able to look through all, past all of that. There's very little artifact with an intracranial EEG. Sometimes we can get a little bit of, of a pulse artifact. Sometimes we can get an EKG artifact. For the most part though, we're right on top of that signal. We're not gonna get much out of that. We're not gonna get much artifact from all of that. Now, this is just uh, to go over a little bit more about how that EEG uh, can, um, can look a little bit different. We see uh, over here with the, uh, uh, the electrodes, if those electrodes, if the signal is coming directly out of the brain, you're going to get it right on top. But if that signal, if you see here, you've got a positive and a negative over here, that negative, that negative, if you follow the arrows, it's going to go all the way and it's going to end up, I don't know if you can see my... Um, if you can see my, uh, my, my, my arrow here on point number one, you can see all of the, uh, uh, the, 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 the message the signal is gonna pick up over on the opposite side. On the other hand, with a depth electrode, and here's an example of what depth electrodes might look like, all of these lines here are depth electrodes that are going directly into a patient's brain. And so those are gonna pick up that information right away. The next thing I wanted to briefly talk about was that the PET scan or the positron emission tomography. Now this is looking at uh, the metabolism of glucose or oxygen in the brain. And so our brain when it's having a seizure requires a lot of energy. And so when the brain is not having a seizure, Usually the part that um, was most active because uh, uh, at a significant level of rest. And so an interictal PET, meaning in between seizures, will display low metabolism or hypometabolism over that epileptogenic region, over the area where the seizures are originating from. On the other hand, sometimes we are uh, uh, able to capture what's called an ictal PET. A patient is actually having a seizure during their their scan or during their PET scan. And then we can see an increase in metabolism during that area. I wanna show you an example of what a PET scan might look like. This is a patient who had uh, epilepsy, a focal epilepsy over the left uh, uh, midline portion of her brain. Okay, now when we're looking at this, imagine that in, in this picture over here, imagine that, her, uh, that she's looking at you. So this is 
uh, what's on the right side of your screen is actually on the left side of her brain. And you can see this very, very blue stripe that's going down the top. That is uh, the area where the seizures were coming from. And you can see how hypometabolic that is. And that is because that's in between seizures. That's where the seizures were coming from. The next thing I wanted to review with everybody is functional MRI. Now, a functional MRI is used to measure the brain activity and determine uh, which part of the brain is responsible for which critical functions. And it does this by detecting changes that are associated with, with blood flow. So we can use a functional MRI to identify where's the language center located? Where is the movement located? Where is sensation located? How about vision? Right? So during, all of the, during this procedure, the patient will perform uh, all, uh, various tasks while uh, the imaging is uh, uh, being performed. And that causes that increase in metabolic activity in the brain, responsible for that area. So the parts of the brain that are responsible for vision, when you're asking somebody to look at something, are going to be much more active. And so you see that in the functional MRI. And basically, that measurement is mapped on the functional MRI. Let me give you an example of all of that. Here is um, a, a 3D reconstruction of the areas uh, of the brain uh, for this functional MRI. And you can see back here, here is the vision in this, uh, this uh, uh, dark brownish orange. Uh, this yellow area over here is language. You can see uh, there's, uh, uh, there's, uh, there's a motor function. In the, in the face and the hand and the legs, all of that is, is showing up on the, our functional MRI. And that helps us identify, okay, well, is the area that's being, uh, that's, uh, that's showing up here, is that, is that brain tissue that is uh, too important for us to, uh, to, to resect? Are we able to resect that, uh, that brain tissue? Or if we do that, if I resect the, an area of brain tissue over here, is my patient gonna lose the ability to speak? Certainly nobody wants that to happen. And so if that were the case, we have to think about other options for our patient. Here's another example of how uh, the functional MRI uh, can look and why it's so important. I like this image because it shows us um, uh, just why um, uh, 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 learning about the patient's functional um, uh, brain activity is, is, is so vital. Uh, this is uh, an image of a young man who uh, had focal seizures over his right temporal lobe. Now, again, remember that uh, when we're looking at these images, the right hemisphere, the right part of the brain is on the left side of your screen, and the, and the, and the left hemisphere is on the right side of your screen. Well, the yellow portion is language, and this is a young man whose language was on the right hemisphere. And that's a very, very rare uh, uh, condition, or not condition, but that's a very, very rare phenomenon. 95 to 99% of us have language on the left hemisphere. And so this young man is one of the 1% of the people who have language on his right hemisphere. And that matters because that really, that really changes what options we have for him when it comes to surgical intervention. The next uh, study that I'm going to uh, discuss is the Single Photon Emission Computed Tomography, or the SPECT, S-P-E-C-T. Now, this, is a, uh, this involves a very safe and short-lived radioactive substance that's injected into the arm during a seizure. Uh, uh, the premise here is that when a person is having a seizure, that there's an increased amount of blood that's flowing through the area of the brain uh, that is actively seizing. And so if you can get this radioactive uh, um, isotope injected very quickly early on in that seizure, your seizure, you're going to have an increased blood flow. That, that isotope is going to be taken to the part of the brain that the seizure is coming from. And then when we can uh, perform uh, the imaging, we will see that area light up. It gets really bright. We follow that up by uh, in following. We follow that up with another injection after the patient has been seizure free for about 24 hours, and then we have essentially our baseline. And what you can do after that is subtract the seizure injection from the non-seizure injection, and all that's left is the area of the brain that's having the seizure. 
here's a great example of that. This is a this is a patient who is having uh, seizures from her, uh, her right um, posterior temporal lobe. And here you can see here this very, very bright spot um, over on the right side. And it, I'm showing it from three different angles, but super, super uh, bright and, and all that. So all that's really showing if you, and we are able to ignore these little, uh, these little speckles over here, but really this is telling us that her seizures are very, very focal. They're very localized in that one area. Now, the last uh, type of neuroimaging uh, or neurophysiology that I want to review with everybody is called the magnetoencephalogram. And this is one that you may or may not be familiar with. It's, it's, uh, uh, I don't want to say it's new because it's not new, but it's also not very common. So the magnetoencephalogram or the MEG or the MEG. Now, uh, the MEG uh, is used, it reads the magnetic field component of an electrical discharge. So this has a different amount of sensitivity compared to an EEG signal, and that allows for a more precise level of localization. So let me explain a little bit, very, very uh, uh, um, uh, surface level uh, uh, summary of what that means. When our brain uh, dis, uh, fires off a, an electrical discharge, every, if you remember back to your, maybe your high school physics or college physics, every electrical um, uh, signal uh, is associated with a magnetic field that basically wraps around that signal. So in this cartoon, we can see uh, that the um, that the the that these nerve cells are all firing off in a parallel direction, and they're all firing off over to the right. And as that happens, this magnetic field in this in this green is wrapping around, it's rotating around. Well, the MEG is going to measure that magnetic field that's wrapping around this electrical source, this electrical discharge. So an EEG might not be able to capture what's happening here, but the MEG is measuring something completely different and it's going to be able to, to read that and pick it up. And so as we do that, it can identify when we, when we compare the MEG plus the MRI, we, we can identify what's called the magnetic source imaging. And that can tell us, much like the, uh, some of these other tests that I was reviewing with you, right? The PET scan, the SPECT, the MEG is just, is, is yet another way for us to identify the source of the seizures or the discharges. And that can give us more data, more information for uh, localizing these seizures. Um, just very quickly, here's a case study of a, uh, this is a three-year-old girl, secondary generalized tonic-clonic seizures, and her MRI showed a cortical dysplasia over the right hemisphere. The MEG showed these spikes in the interhemispheric sulcus, right? And then in the end, the patient underwent func uh, a functional hemispherotomy, meaning that uh, uh, the um, the right hemisphere was essentially disconnected from the from the left hemisphere, and that led to seizure freedom. But what you can see in the mag over here is that all of these discharges were showing up in that occipital region, in the back of the brain. Okay. Now, one of the other studies and pre-surgical studies that I had mentioned was neuropsychology, and this is a very very important. Uh, uh, um, uh, study that, that, that anybody who's undergoing uh, or being considered for uh, uh, surgical evaluation, uh, highly recommend that they, they get, that they undergo a neuropsychological workup as well. And so what is neuropsychology? Well, it's a series of tests that are carried out, uh, that, that are carried out by a neuropsychologist. Now, this is a very, very uh, in-depth series of tests. It can take anywhere between four to eight hours to do that complete workup. Now, oftentimes this is split up in multiple days and uh, they are frequently repeated every one to two years. So you can identify if there's, you have some objective uh, uh, numbers to evaluate um, how is the patient progressing or is the patient regressing? Are their symptoms getting worse? And so what does this measure? It measures a lot. It measures things that, you know, for the most part, we, we, we wouldn't be able to see that um, 
at, at, at face value, but there's a lot of important information that comes from neuropsychological evaluations. It measures the intelligence, measures memory, it measures language and attention, our visual processing, not vision itself, but our visual processing, our auditory processing, and our executive processing, our critical thinking. That's important because each of these functions can be linked with a specific area of the brain. And so if a person is uh, presenting with impairment in their language, we know both with our functional MRI and sometimes even with the MEG and with neuropsychology, we can identify if that area of the brain is impaired and if that area of the brain is uh, um, susceptible to um, to um, improvement or, or harm related to surgical evaluation. So this is just a very quick, right? This is only a 30 minute uh, discussion, but this is a very, very brief um, sum summary of what that pre-surgical evaluation can look like. And once all of that information is obtained, we use that information to identify that epileptogenic region of the brain. And from there, we work with our neurosurgery colleagues like Dr. Patra to determine the best type of intervention for our patients. Now, uh, I have an opportunity to hand over uh, the next part of this uh, uh, discussion to my friend and colleague, Dr. Patra. He's going to talk a little bit more about what those surgical interventions can look like. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. DeVries. It really well explained. Uh, you, you did a great job of explaining very complex information. So we appreciate that. And um, Dr. Patra, uh, again, Dr. Patra is a neurosurgeon at uh, Spectrum Health and uh, pleased to have you here today. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to this forum about a subject that you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really, really passionate about, about the innovations that are occurring, particularly over the last five years. And it's, um, it's really exciting. Um, and I hope to um, uh, part, you know, um, provide everybody with a little bit of that um, background information so they can have some insight into what's available right now and what might be coming down the pipelines uh, fairly soon. So, um, Again, my name is Sanjay Patra. I am an epilepsy surgeon in Grand Rapids, Michigan at Spectrum Health. Um, so uh, in this talk, I wanna kind of provide an overview of available treatments, including surgery, um, what's called laser ablation, vagal nerve stimulation, deep brain stimulation, responsive neurostimulation. I know that's a lot of... <laughs> Uh, various terms, and we'll go over each one of those um, in, in more detail and um, how artificial intelligence is going to help. Um, we'll discuss um, how well these therapies currently work. We'll try to compare uh, different modalities and we'll go through, uh, you know, our particular approach to see what type of therapy a patient may be a candidate for. And um, in doing so, we're going to talk about some of the different types of epilepsy um, and, and what therapies may or may not work for those types of epilepsies. So focal epilepsy, lesional epilepsy is just a fancy term for an epilepsy associated with an abnormality on an MRI scan and, and, the, and the more difficult to treat broad onset epilepsy. Um, so um, Seth went over you know, um, what it means to be medically refractory. Um, and this can occur in anywhere from 25 to 33% of patients where despite being on multiple medications, um, you know, uh, patients continue to have disabling seizures and, and that generally um, brings about an evaluation in our epilepsy conference as to what we can do um, with surgery to see if we can help improve or eliminate those seizures completely. Um, so broadly speaking, there are two types of surgical treatments. Um, what's been around the longest is the so-called destructive treatments. And what's newer is the restorative treatments. Um, so destructive, you know, there's really two ways to do this. One is through 
um, open surgery where you do a traditional surgery, and if the seizures are occurring from, you know, a smaller area of the brain that um, is not responsible for critical function, then that area can be removed. Uh, it usually requires a 10 to 15 centimeter incision on the scalp. Um, what's newer is what's called laser ablation. Now, this has been actually around now for about 10 to 15 years, where if that area of the brain that's producing the seizures is small enough and it's configured in, a, in an appropriate fashion, you can actually um, heat up that area of the brain and destroy that area of the brain using a two millimeter diameter fiber optic catheter. So this little catheter is placed uh, within the center of that area through a one centimeter incision. Um, and then that catheter again is only about the, you know, the, the diameter of a tip of a pen. And you can accomplish what you um, used to accomplish through an, uh, through an open surgery through a much smaller incision. So, so, so why, why would we want to do these destructive, destructive uh, type of procedures? Um, and, and the answer is, you know, um, they work in the, you know, if a patient is carefully selected and all those seizures are just coming from that once, one small spot, there's a 50 to 90% chance of seizure freedom um, and actually stopping the epilepsy completely. Um, you know, our general philosophy is people do better with an intact brain. So we only recommend this type of procedure if, you know, there's at least a 50% chance of an individual becoming seizure free with that, that particular procedure. Um, we are noticing in our practice, we are doing a lot more laser ablation procedures than open surgery um, for obvious reasons. Um, now, a lot of the innovation has been occurring in the so-called restorative um, types of surgeries. Now, if the seizures are, are originating from critically important areas of the brain or from large segments of the brain, the destructive procedures really aren't an option um, because certainly we don't want patients to come out of a surgery um, with any type of neurological deficit in movement or language or under understanding. Um, so th this is actually a, quite a large segment of patients who end up not being candidates for the destructive procedure. And hence the development of technologies such as vagal nerve stimulation, uh, deep brain stimulation, and most recently responsive neural stimulation. Um, the vagal nerve stimula stimulator has been around since uh, 1997, so it's not that new, um, but um, it is one of the first neuromodulatory therapies or restorative therapies, and um, the studies were showed fairly good results. Generally, when I counsel patients who are referred to me for this type of a procedure, I say, you know, you have about a 50% chance of having at least a 50% reduction in your seizures. Um, now, there have been some longer term studies that have come out that have showed that patients who've had the stimulator in longer, so once they have the stimulator in for about four to five years, have about a 60% um, uh, chance of having a greater, um, sorry, I have 60% six, of those patients have a greater than 50% reduction in their seizures. So vagal nerve stimulators, along with some of the, um, the newer devices, such as deep brain stimulation and responsive neuro stimulation, tend to do better with time. Um, we don't exactly know why that is, but that is definitely an area of, of, of active research. One of the more recent innovations in vagal nerve stimulation, which has been around for at least five years now, is the heart rate sensing ability. So normally, you know, the, vega, the vagal nerve simulator, um, the device um, is placed around the vagus nerve, which is a nerve that originates in the brain. And if a patient has a seizure and they have an aura, for instance, they can actually swipe um, the battery here, which is um, implanted under your um, clavicle, 
typically on the left side and, and cause a stimulation that can abort the seizure. Um, you can also um, have this cycled on and off periodically throughout the day or throughout the hour to kind of prevent seizures from occurring. Um, but a lot of the more recent data has shown that almost all seizures have some change in heart rate associated right when those seizures start. So the latest version of the vagal nerve stimulator battery can detect those heart rate changes and, and, and deliver an impulse you know, right at the onset of the seizure to try to stop and abort that seizure. Um, so, you know, that, that, that's the main uh, technological advancement in the vagal nerve stimulator uh, over the past five years. Um, deep brain stimulation. Now, deep brain stimulation has also been around for a long time. It's, it's been used primarily to treat uh, patients with movement disorders or Parkinson's disease. Um, but over the years, it's also been applied to patients with epilepsy. So, um, so, so what, what is a deep brain structure? So when we talk about epilepsy, the deep brain structure that's used to treat is this area right in the center of the brain. There's one on each side called the thalamus. And, and why do we want to treat um, in, in a deep brain structure? Well, the reason is that some seizures could be originating from the entire side of the brain or on both sides of the brain or a very large region of the brain where you can't really remove that area of the brain without causing a lot, a lot of functional deficits. So by delivering electrical therapy in this area, because this area is connected to, you know, basically the entire hemisphere, you can improve seizure control by treating a very small area of, of the brain with electrical stimulation. Um, that's the rationale um, behind why these types of devices were, were invented. Um, now, a deep brain stimulator like a vagal nerve stimulator is generally an on or off system, um, although some of the latest versions will have a little, a little bit of capacity to try to sense brain waves, but for the most part, uh, a vagal nerve stimulator is um, either on or off. Sorry, a, a deep brain stimulator is either on or off. Now the effectiveness is, is very good. Um, about a 70% reduction in seizures in patients who've had the device um, implanted for about five years. Um, again, um, this is a, 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 again, a cartoon depicting where these electrodes are typically placed and you can have typically have two contacts Usually one is placed on the right side and one is on the left side. And um, the battery is placed again under the, right underneath your uh, collarbone on the left side. So the kind of the, 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 the most recent technological advancement is the so-called um, responsive neural stimulation or RNS. So this device um, is, is a little different from a DBS in that um, you can place the electrodes either within a deep brain structure or even on the surface of the brain as well. Um, so that's one difference. The other difference is that this battery, okay, is implanted within the skull. There's, there's no more um, battery that has to be implanted uh, below your collarbone. This is all underneath your scalp uh, within the skull. This device can actually record EEGs directly from the brain um, right here. And as a seizure starts, which is depicted right here, it can automatically detect that once we program it and deliver an electrical impulse to stop that seizure. So this is um, you know, what's called um, a closed loop system, meaning that it's able to um, monitor, recognize and respond and it continually records. So again, this is another example of an EEG, normal EEG here, seizure is starting here. The, uh, the device can automatically detect that, deliver an electrical impulse to try to stop that seizure. And, and um, this is what it looks like back to normal here. So, you know, this device obviously um, 
requires more input from the surgical team and your epileptologist. But what's kind of exciting about this is the new developments where kind of artificial intelligence will start to look at these patterns and actually start picking up the seizures much earlier than when, you know, humans can actually detect it when we see these more obvious changes. The hope is that with artificial intelligence, we can detect the seizures here, okay, where it looks normal to the human eye, deliver an electrical impulse that will stop the seizure before it even starts at all, um, as far as what we could normally see. The other potential advantage is that um, because this is all recorded, it can all be stored and um, you can actually look at the thousands of patients who've had this type of seizure, for instance, and then determine what the best way to stop this type of seizure, seizure is based on the thousands of patients who've had this type of seizure in the past and looking at what worked for that patient um, as opposed to what didn't work. So, so that's, that's where the artificial intelligence will come into play. There's several companies actively working on this. Um, and, and I think within the next five to 10 years, we're gonna see the, the artificial intelligence really um, start to you know, take flight. Um, so how well does this work? Well, the latest study came out in, um, in August of 2020, and it was called the real world study. And, and it showed about an 82% reduction in seizures in patients who've had the device implanted for three years. There was also about 35% of patients who had greater than 90% reduction in seizure frequency. And about 40% of patients were actually, actually had a seizure free period. Um, uh, of at least six months um, since they had the device implanted. So again, with all of these restorative therapies, the chances of seizure freedom are still significantly less than with the destructive procedure. So, um, but what we're seeing now is with some of the, the newer devices, that, that chance of seizure freedom is starting to get close to the seizure freedom, freedom that you can achieve with a destructive procedure, although there's still a ways to go. Um, one important thing as well with, with the neuromodulatory devices or the, or the restorative devices, this data here is, is particular for the RNS device. We, Seth briefly talked about SUDEP, which is sudden, sudden unexpected death in epilepsy patients, and that Typically, a patient who's a candidate for epilepsy surgery, the chances of that is about nine per 1,000 patient years, okay? So it's not very high, but it's still significant. So if you had 1,000 patients um, and you track them over a year, about nine of them could potentially um, pass with SUDEP. With the RNS system, this drops to two. Um, and we've noticed the same trends with DBS as well, um, a drop in the SUDEP rate. So this is important to kind of keep in mind um, uh, as, I mean, obviously this is a significant issue and if we can, every little um, step we take in the right direction is, is huge. Um, so I always like to point that out. Um, so, what types of epilepsy you know, are these therapies good for? First, let's just categorize the two types of epilepsy. So one is what's called focal seizures, where the seizures begin in really a more discrete area of the brain. And um, out of the patients who are drug resistant, about two thirds okay, are, have this type of epilepsy, where just in a small area of the brain. Some of those can be candidates for the laser or the open surgery and are good um, and, and can have a you know, 50 to 90% chance of complete seizure freedom. But some of those patients, um, those seizures are coming from a very important area of the brain and you can't just uh, remove that area of the brain. There's about one third of patients where the seizure is just coming from a broad area of the brain. Okay, it could be from an entire lobe, an entire hemisphere, which is the entire side of one brain, or they can occur from 
both sides simultaneously um, and, and in what's called primary generalized epilepsy. Um, so some of the, the neuromodulation that we talked about, um, you know, we've kind of applied that now to lesional epilepsy, which is a type of focal epilepsy, again, originating from one area of the brain uh, with an abnormality visible on MRI scans. So historically, a lot of these areas were treated with surgery. The problem with a disease like tuberous sclerosis is that just treating that one area of abnormality still may not render that individual seizure free. So this is a small series that we looked at targeting patients with tuberous sclerosis and um, really promising early results. This was only on five patients. It's recently um, published in a journal um, and it showed an 88% average seizure reduction in those five patients. So really promising results. Studies like this though, we have to take with a grain of salt because they're very small and we really need to replicate them on a wider scale. Um, what about patients with generalized epilepsy that's starting from a whole lobe or hemisphere? Um, more recently, we've um, applied the Neuropace device to some deep brain structures. Um, and again, we, we're, we're seeing good results. Um, uh, in the first seven patients that we published in, in November, we had an average of 88% reduction in, in disabling seizures. Um, so th this is all very preliminary work and um, in the next three to four years, we're gonna see a lot more data to see how generalizable this, this work is. But it is really um, exciting because we've seen some great results and, and really with patients who've had um, extremely difficult to control seizures occurring from both sides of the brains, they've had multiple surgeries, um, multiple intracranial investigations and um, we're starting to see that some of these patients can actually have a benefit with um, Neuropace or, or DBS. Um, and this is just a profile of each of those seven patients. So one of them was essentially seizure free. Two of them had greater than 90% reduction and, um, and all of them had at least a 50% reduction. What about complications? So every Anytime there's a surgery, there, there is a risk of complication and, and, and all surgeries have a risk of bleeding and infection. Um, you know, and, and if that happens in the brain or around where the vagus nerve is, the, those complications been, can be severe, but thankfully the overall risk of really something catastrophic or life-changing ha life changing happening um, is really less, in our experience, is, is really less than 1%. Um, but if you look at some of the studies that have been published, you know, there is a close to a 10% risk of infection with either DBS or RNS with vagal nerve stimulator. Um, and some of you who have this device, you, you know that if it goes off, it can create a tickling in your throat, having to cough or clear your throat. Um, and I've had patients who've, you know, that, that became so disabling that they eventually just turned it off because you know, um, that actually became worse than the seizures they were, they were having. So all devices, any type of surgery has some complications. Really important that you kind of talk this over with your, um, with your epilepsy surgeon and your epileptologist and really get a good sense of what your particular risk is um, for a procedure. Um, we actually looked, we actually compared uh, at one point the complication rates between um, um, between um, RNS and VNS. And there was no real change in the complications that we, we could find, at least in our patient population. So what is the best treatment? Again, I, I wish I could say, well, this is the best treatment. Really all three of these modalities, um, as far as restorative therapies, can have benefits in selected patients. So it's really important that you, you, you partner with your, your epileptologist and your epilepsy surgeon and, and really come up with the best treatment uh, that's best suited for you. Because oftentimes there is, there, there is some choice involved. Um, and um, we, we always factor that 
the, the patient choice into what device would work, work best for them. Although the RNS has some amazing results, it does require more patient input. So that, you know, you have to upload the data, you know, um, about once a week. So, I mean, it, it, it's more, you know, time consuming for a patient than a VNS or a DBS. So in conclusion, there's, there's really multiple effective modalities available now. If a seizure is coming from one region and it's safe to remove that region, we generally recommend laser ablation or open surgery because of that 50 to 90% seizure freedom rate with those types of procedures. If the seizures are coming from two different areas or multiple areas, that's where we start recommending the restorative devices such as DBS or RNS or VNS. Um, and, 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 and the latest results are quite uh, promising um, and more to come on that. Um, but, you know, re really there, there's just a plethora of advancements and I just threw together this slide to show some of the stuff that has come out, you know, besides the actual VNS, DBS and RNS, um, you know, the so-called stereo EEG that, that Dr. Uh, DeVries talked about, um, utilizing the, the ROSA robot really precisely places those electrodes so we can map out where those seizures are coming from um, to less than one millimeter of error. This is a, a new 3D printed um, frame that we can use to really accurately place electrodes. This cartoon down here is uh, a depiction of our intraoperative MRI where you can actually do um, the surgery within the MRI. So you can see exactly where those electrodes are, are going in real time. Um, and then there's all these advances in imaging that have occurred even over the past year, literally, you know, the, there's a new imaging modality now where we can see some of those structures within the thalamus and directly target them. Whereas two or three years ago, we, we weren't able to do that. So really a ton of innovation that's come through over the past five years. Um, lastly, I wanna acknowledge, you know, you know, our, our team, it, it's really some, you know, sometimes the surgeons will, will get credit if a patient does well, you know, with surgery and they're seizure free, but it, it, it really, we rely on the epileptologist to, to help out with the workup. There's our, um, our neurosurgical APPs, nurse practitioners, nurse coordinators, neuropsychologists, it, it really takes a huge team to really um, provide the best options for patients. And I just wanna acknowledge that it's not all the surgeon. And that's it, ready for questions. Okay, great, very exciting stuff. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Patra. All right, so for, for, an infant, or for, for an infant with infantile spasms who was given an MRI and PET, and the neurologist determined she was not a surgical candidate, does it make sense to do additional testing, for example, the fMRI, MEG, or SPECT? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a very, very good question. I think a, a lot of it comes down to, um, and, and yeah, uh, Dr. Patra, I'm gonna go ahead and take this one as the pediatric yeah. epileptologist, but um, you know, uh, infantile spasms as a whole is, is a very complicated um, form of epilepsy. Uh, and um, the, that in itself has a lot of variability to it. There can be children who present with generalized spasms, and there can be children who present with what's called hemispasms, and, and uh, there, are, there can be focal spasms. And so, you know, EEG and the MRI can be helpful uh, in identifying if this is a generalized infantile spasms versus uh, hemispasms, uh, most definitely. Um, Additional workup um, for an infant, uh, functional MRI could be a little bit challenging, uh, but it's not out of the question. Um, one of the reasons why it could be challenging is because you do need the patient to be, for the most part, you need the patient to be cooperative. And it's kind of hard to say to a, to, a, uh, to a six month old, hey, I want you to move your right finger, right? That's, 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 that's not really gonna happen. We are able to do functional MRIs on uh, children under some mild sedation. And then we can identify if their sensory exam is, is effective. Um, language isn't so much. Now, one of the, one of the most um, uh, encouraging aspects of 
pediatric surgery though, is that uh, infants have um, what's known as neuroplasticity. So that if they do undergo any sort of uh, significant or, or aggressive uh, resection uh, of brain tissue, um, nothing has been really set uh, in terms of their, their, uh, uh, the, their brain function. And so there's still that, that the, the neuroplasticity allows uh, the brain to compensate for what otherwise could have been lost in all of that. Now that's not quite answering the question. The question was, is there any benefit to getting MRI or, uh, uh, excuse me, fMRI or MEG or, and I think a lot of that really comes down to whether or not uh, uh, this is a generalized epilepsy, generalized spasms or focal spasms. If these are generalized spasms, it's going to be, you know, truth is it's gonna be uh, very unlikely that a surgery is going to uh, provide uh, the child with um, uh, any, any uh, significant improvement. There are additional tests that probably need to be done. Like um, if, if metabolic testing or genetic testing hasn't been pursued, that is something that I would highly recommend uh, because there are a lot of genetic conditions that are associated with infantile spasms. Um, and then in terms of you know, additional uh, management or um, uh, intervention, this is a great um, example of when the ketogenic diet can be helpful. If there is a child with infantile spasms and uh, uh, unfortunately um, aggressive medications like ACTH or Vigabatrin have been tried and those medications have failed, uh, it's worth considering the ketogenic diet as well. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so what, what are some options uh, from a neurostimulation standpoint um, for w w when there's an epilepsy focus in the insula? Um, the, the person specifically asked about DBS, but uh, would RNS be an option? Are there other options for, um, or is resection an option or ablation an option for the insula? So the, the, the answer to is all of the above. So, um, so if we're very convinced that um, the seizures are coming from a discrete portion of the insula, particularly if there's an abnormality in that area of the insula on the MRI scan, um, laser ablation you know, is, is really a good option in those patients. Surgery, we're not doing as much open surgery in the insula because that, that surgery has a higher risk than traditional epilepsy surgery in the insula and laser ablation just really lowers the risk profile. Um, so if we're very convinced that the, you know, that the, the seizures are coming from a discrete area of the insula, then, then the laser ablation is, is an option. If we're thinking that the insula is a part of a large or broader epilepsy network, then we would probably do an RNS or a DBS, depending on um, the specific network of, uh, of that patient. Um, but probably more than likely, at least in our practice, they would, they would get an RNS. For people with extremely, extremely complicated cases that we've had that really have very broad networks, sometimes we've done a combination of an RNS or, and a DBS. But again, that, that is off-label and not, not something that we would routinely recommend, but in very complex patients, we have done it as a palliative uh, measure. Okay, great. Um, speaking of laser ablation, can that be used for cor corpus callosotomy? Yes. Huh. Yeah. It, yeah, there's some, been it, several it, studies it, coming. Is, is it used primarily that now? Just is it taken over? Uh, yeah the traditional method of corpus callosotomy, would you say? Or? So as an adult neurosurgeon, I don't do a lot of corpus callosotomy period, but I, I, I can, I can uh, divert that question to Seth. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, um, using laser ablation for corpus callosotomy is, um, I, again, it's, it's not, so I would say that the corpus callosotomy is, is not a new uh, procedure. 
but using it, uh, performing that with laser ablation, and I wish that my uh, some of my pediatric neurosurgery colleagues uh, were with me. We've we've done uh, um, several corpus callosotomies, and the laser laser ablation um, is a fairly new approach to this. Um, it has been used. It has been shown to be very effective. Um, and um, when it comes to the the callosotomy. Uh, one of the nice benefits of using the laser ablation is that um, we try very hard not to do a complete callosotomy and, and have a complete uh, uh, complete uh, dissection of the two hemispheres. It's nice to just to do a partial callosotomy, if you will. Uh, and so the laser ablation can actually provide a little bit more of um, uh, I want to say I, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say use the word precision in that. Um, and then also um, just uh, um, in terms of recovery, uh, and Dr. Patra, you can, um, you know, you can uh, kind of go in with more detail, but I mean, the truth is uh, yeah. recovery from a laser ablation is much faster than uh, recovery from a, a, a craniotomy with a surgical resection. Yeah, the, the complications, and, and if, if we did a callosotomy with a laser ablation, I mean, it's, it, you know, it's um, a little more involved than a traditional laser ablation because um, you got to, you know, use a couple of additional approaches. But I mean, literally, the patient could go home the next day or even the same day. And and frankly, that's the case with most laser ablation. Most RNS or DBS patients are going home, um, you know, the next day, as opposed to the open surgery where you're, you know, it's, it's really a much bigger. Uh, recovery period and you're in the hospital for several days. We're on the verge of outpatient brain surgery, it sounds like. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I patients who really want to go home after an RNS procedure, I've sent them home because they wanted to. I get a CAT scan after their surgery and, they're, and they've gone home later that evening. So it's, it's not, you know, it, it's not inconceivable for, for you to go home from that type of surgery. In fact, in, in, in Canada and in Toronto, I'm, I'm originally from Toronto, um, they have a huge brain tumor group at the University of Toronto and they've studied 2000 patients where they've sent patients home after brain tumor surgery, which is much more um, kind of invasive than what we're talking about. Um, and they've done that in this, at the same day with, with, with good success and, and no increase in complications. But we're not at that stage yet. I mean, we, we really go on by what the patient wants. I mean, some patients really hate to be in the hospital and um, we will let them go home if we feel it's safe for them to go home. Okay, great. Another, another question, is there a benefit to waiting for children to age before approaching a surgery if the seizures are currently mild? Uh, this person's son is 11 and has focal epilepsy um, or is it better to treat when they're adolescents or adults? Um, I guess one of the things that comes into this is the whole idea of plasticity. So can, can you address that question? Uh, well, I will say that neuroplasticity usually kind of reaches its kind of the end stages of that plasticity at around four or five years of age. So um, 11 is uh, uh, slightly outside of that window, um, although it's not unheard of. Children just respond and recover faster than, than adults um, uh, in, in many ways. Um, the question of, you know, should you wait or not? Uh, I think it's, it, there, are, it, there are a lot of factors to that. Uh, there are forms of epilepsy that children have where they literally outgrow their epilepsy. And if, and if the child has an epilepsy syndrome that we expect uh, them to outgrow, uh, then we oftentimes will hold off on performing any sort of surgery. Uh, or if, if we need to pursue surgery, um, it might be uh, uh, something that's you know, you know, relatively less invasive like the vagus nerve stimulator as opposed to DBS or RNS. Um, if a child um, is presenting with an epilepsy syndrome and we anticipate that it is not something they're going to outgrow, um, you know, the, the research is showing, evidence is showing the sooner that you uh, per, pursue surgical intervention, the better the outcomes for the children. Um, and that's more than just from seizure con uh, from a seizure standpoint, but we are, uh, we are seeing uh, uh, the literature come out and show that patients with epilepsy uh, have a higher risk of 
um, additional learning, uh, learning disabilities, um, uh, uh, such as uh, ADHD and anxiety and um, nonverbal learning disabilities. And, uh, um, and so if, if there's an opportunity for us to provide those uh, children with intervention so that their, uh, their ability to succeed in school is improved, their, um, their ability to have um, uh, uh, better control uh, with mental health is improved, then we wanna take that. Uh, these are formative years in a child's life. Uh, and um, we don't wanna lose that. We don't want the child to lose that. Right, and, and um, you know, the other thing that would be um, uh, in, important in that is, is the severity of the seizures too, because if they are, I think the person used the term mild seizures, um, you'd certainly have to consider how, how much those seizures are disrupting daily functioning uh, before pursuing surgery. Um, okay, so uh, another question. Um, it, it, uh, can you talk a little bit about kind of the, the diagnostic value of the RNS? Uh, and it, someone asked if it was used more as a diagnostic tool and it, it is in fact a therapy, but um, the fact that it's record, constantly recording the electrical activity in the brain uh, and being able to de detect seizures, which you know people are and, and caregivers are, are notoriously have a hard time with uh, accurately reporting in, uh, the number of seizures. Um, can you talk about kind of those ben those benefits in terms of the diagnostic and seizure tracking value of the RNS? Yeah, I, mean, I can start off. I, Seth will have more details as far as the diagnosis aspect. The vast majority of the RNSs we place are placed for the purposes of therapy. Having said that, once they're in there, they all become diagnostic tools. Um, and um, the epileptologists in our group love it because they can more accurately track um, how patients are doing. For instance, there's really a lot of data coming out from the RNS devices where seizures are not random. Seizures that you think are random are not really random. There are variations that may occur in, in monthly time periods or every several months or every several days. These are patterns you know, we wouldn't normally be able to tell on our own but most seizures are part of some type of algorithm, you know, um, a, a variation of some kind, whether it be seasonal or monthly. So um, certainly that has a potential to kind of, you know, deliver more therapy during those peak periods, um, uh, maybe adjusting medications, you know, during those peak periods, uh, maybe seeing how a medication um, affects the activity really early. So if, if, if the epileptologist is trying a new medication and, you know, really they, they start it and, you know, they're not seeing any seizure or seizure-like activity or seeing increase actively, well, maybe they, they don't trial it for six months, you know, or three months. Maybe they pull that medication early. Um, or if they're seeing a benefit in the pre-seizure activity of a medication, even though the actual clinical seizures are not improving, well, maybe that's a medication that you got to escalate the dose on um, and try it longer to get it to somewhere where, because if it's stopping the pre-seizure activity, you might be able to stop the, the seizure activity. So Seth, uh, yeah, feel free to add <laughs> any details. Yeah, I think, well, what I can, what I can add to this is when, when uh, RNS first came available and when, when the, when the research was coming out, um, the, uh, uh, there was there were some very interesting numbers that were showing that uh, the patients who who had an RNS implant um, were asked to um, self-identify their seizures uh, and and then also uh, use the RNS and and then also uh, submit the RNS data as well to identify. So they had both the computer telling, okay, this is how many, the, 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 the electrodes were saying you had a seizure, this, this many seizures in the past month. And then you had the patients saying, oh, I had this many seizures. When did you have them? What did you have? And, and the truth is that the patients were not accurate at all. 
um, the you know patient data um, is uh, um, you know it's important by all means you know we want to know if 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 my patient said yeah I had a seizure I'm going to write that down I'm going there's no way I'm going to discount that uh, but the but the fact um, was that this that the RNS was identifying uh, uh, how many seizures the patient might have missed um, and uh, or how how often the patient was um, had erroneously attributed some sort of uh, phenomenon to a seizure when it wasn't a seizure. And so um, uh, the RNS was very, very helpful in that. Um, now we have to remember that these patients underwent surgery, surgical implantation of this device. And in doing so, a, a generator was drilled into their skull and electrodes were placed on top of their brain. So this was not you know, intended to be um, something that was strictly um, diagnostic. There, there, there had to be a, a therapeutic value to this. Um, and, and to this day, there is a therapeutic value. I am not going to um, uh, send my, my patients to the operating room uh, with the, uh, the sole purpose of just identifying, oh, are they having seizures? Um, did they have a seizure at 10 o'clock on Saturday night? That's that's not what I'm, I'm not gonna send them to the OR for that. Right. Um, fortunately, we have a lot of new technology that can help from a more diagnostic uh, approach like that, like the epilepsy monitoring unit, um, uh, which is uh, an, an inpatient procedure uh, where we bring the patients into the hospital. We run, we hook up the EEG scalp electrodes, not intracranial electrodes, and we run that EEG for, uh, uh, a long period of time, 24 hours, 48 hours, you know, seven days, two weeks maybe. Um, and, and that can give us a little bit more information about what is the seizure burden for our patients. Um, the technology is also showing that ambulatory EEGs are improving. Um, and there's a lot more, uh, um, we're seeing a lot better uh, data. We're seeing a lot uh, higher quality information that comes from an ambulatory EEG than it used to be. Those, those EEGs used to be just filled with all sorts of artifact and just noise and it was, you know, it was almost useless. Um, and uh, more and more of these ambulatory studies are showing better and better results. And so those, if we're looking for purely diagnostic approach, those would be uh, uh, some, some uh, excellent resources uh, and you don't have to have anything drilled into your skull to get them. Right. Yeah. In interestingly, there's, I'm actually meeting with a company out of Canada later today. They have a, the device that they're, um, they've developed where you can do an ambulatory intracranial EEG. So this is, this will be, you know, they, they're still early in the process of development, but it's very promising that you'll be able to do an SEG type, so the intracranial electrode placement that will have a wireless connection. Um, and uh, you'll have to wear um, still a headpiece around it and patients, at least theoretically, will be able to go home for several weeks at a time and, and um, really monitor the seizures at home. Um, obviously there's a lot of issues with that because there's no video monitoring which is really helpful um, when we see those videos, but um, that is something that's um, also being developed um, really just, just out of Canada that's, right now. And that's, there's some good, there's some good um, potential to that because the further out we get from the surgery, the more um, typical a patient's yeah. seizures become. You know, uh, the seizures that a patient has right out of surgery is, you know, in, is not necessarily the, the, the type of seizure that they would have on a regular basis. So, you know, giving them the opportunity to go home for a couple of weeks, I mean, there's, there's some benefit to that. Right. There's also a lot of risk. There's certainly a lot of risk. Like, uh, as Dr. Potter just said, you know, there's no video. We don't know what they're gonna look like. Um, what type of monitoring are they having when, you know, in terms of uh, 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 post-surgical uh, care as well. Right. Um, you, you mentioned SEEG. Can you, uh, Dr. Potter, can you just briefly talk about um, the use of SEEG, SEEG versus subdural grids? Is SEEG becoming more common? Is, are, what are the pros and 
quickly kind of the pros and cons of, of both of those. Yeah, so, so um, our practice has completely evolved over the past seven years where we're doing almost exclusively SEG. Um, it, it really gives better you know, 3D resolution of where those seizures are coming from. It has um, generally a better signal for the epileptologist to look at. And it's really um, a lot easier to recover from for a patient. Um, having said that, there's still a few rare cases where we do the subdural, particularly if we see an anomaly on the, directly on the surface of the brain on an MRI scan, or if it's right in the language area of the brain, sometimes we'll place, a, do a traditional grid over that area to help with brain mapping. If we think there's a chance that um, there's a seizure generator right around the language area that could potentially be removed, then that's another potential use of these subdural grids. But Again, with the subdural grids, or the, the SEG, the patients can go home the same day once the electrodes are removed. Um, so it's, it's, it's really a kind of a game changer as, as far as the recovery period for patients. Okay, great. And one more quick question. Can VNS, RNS, or DBS be used to treat generalized infantile spasms? So um, I think the big challenge with that comes down to FDA approval. Um, you know, uh, RNS and DBS are not FDA approved in, in, in anyone under the age of 18. RNS um, and then vagus nerve stimulator is not uh, approved uh, under the age of two. Um, if a child is presenting with, you know, infantile spasms, uh, one, of the, one of the things that we do see is that um, many children with infantile spasms, uh, their, the, their epilepsy will eventually, if, if their spasms do not resolve, their epilepsy might uh, transition from uh, infantile spasms to a condition that's known as lennox gastaut syndrome. And um, uh, with lennox gastaut syndrome, that's a generalized epilepsy syndrome. And we have many children who have responded to uh, neurostimulation like uh, vagus nerve stimulator or uh, 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 bilateral uh, corticothalamic uh, uh, RNS with uh, Lennox Gastaut syndrome. Um, uh, with infantile spasms, I th there's there's a lot of the issue comes down to the size of the child, uh, and uh, their head is still growing, their brain is still growing. So placing electrodes into into an infant brain uh, uh, on a permanent basis. Uh, be, uh, just raises a lot of challenges uh, because of that anatomy and that growth that happens. Placing a vagus nerve stimulator in a, in a young child um, uh, provides a little bit more, more than a little bit, a lot more um, uh, um, flexibility, if, uh, a lot more leeway uh, because placing that, that, uh, that uh, generator in the chest with a wire that has a lot of um, slack, if you will, uh, to the to the vagus nerve uh, allows uh, um, some room for growth um, that uh, the DBS and the RNS uh, uh, don't have as much of that room for. Well, we are out of time. So thank you both so much for, for excellent presentations. Uh, it's really exciting to see the development over the years and, and what we can expect in, in the future. So